I want to express my happiness to have this invitation in particular because stochastic modeling in neuroscience and, and as Eva said, I'm a probabilist. And so when I look at something, the, the stochastic nature pops out and I can hardly see anything else. So, so um, and also I am convinced that, that we have to look at stochasticity in order to uh, understand the brain. It's a matter of, yes, there are many scales and we cannot deal with all of them. So, so something has to be considered stochastic. We are, we are all curious about consciousness. Each one of us has our own, our own interior of the mind, which is of which we are aware. That's what we call consciousness. And and uh, humanity from the beginning has been asking questions about this. We are curious what it is. We don't understand it, and we give it various names through the ages. But now we are on the ed edge of a little bit of of understanding what it is and we're eager to grow further into it. And, and this, this uh, work with Lawrence Ward, uh, besides the work of many other people, is, is one more attempt in this direction. So what is the physical substrate of consciousness? Well, we, we know that there is a a uh, neural firing field, which is driven by sensory and other input, and um, it is involving in evolving time and and created by activity of of um, many many neurons, um, and uh, you see the illustrations there. The third illustration, I is an adaptation from. I think a blackboard of Antonio's. Uh, where is the part of this neural field that's associated with attention? Well, there is, uh, the answer is the thalamus in mammals, and in particular, the pulvinar, which is a subset of the thalamus. And we know quite a lot about uh, this system from but what can be physically observed? So we, we know what we call the connectome, uh, what is connected with what. Uh, this, this is uh, my own uh, rendition of just the part of the brain that this talk is going to be about and not all the other parts. Uh, so we know that different, uh, many different uh, regions of the cortex are connected with the pulvinar in both directions. That means that information is going from the pulvinar into the cortex, and also there's feedback from the cortex into the pulvinar. And I'm going to look at two pieces of cortex, how they're connected with each other, and how they're connected with the pulvinar. We also know that there are frequencies um, uh, that we can uh, we can see on our uh, EEG screen, uh, as in the previous slide, there are frequencies. the The pulvinar produces a slow, comparatively slow, ten hertz uh, vibration, whereas in the cortex. Primarily, there, there are various frequencies, but the dominant one in the cortex, especially when we are awake, is called uh, gamma frequency. And gamma frequency is about 40 hertz. And I'd like you to try to remember that gamma frequency is the one in the cortex. It's the fast frequency. And alpha frequency is... Uh, the dominant one in the pulvinar, and that's about 10 hertz. As an introduction, I want to describe um, a firing model of in a paper by Quox and Jensen and Tessinga, uh, which has the name starting with top-down control uh, from uh, a few years ago now. Um, so in their firing model, 
they uh, they program uh, 500 individual neurons. There is there are no equations for this model. It's a, what they call a computer model, and it's uh, and it's composed of their their program. Now they use uh, an Isakevich integrated and fire uh, neuron, basically. And then every uh, they they call uh, 100 of their neurons. They call them inhibitory neurons, and the rest excitatory neurons. And all of these neurons are connected. Every pair of them is connected. The pairs, which consist of two excitatory neurons, are uh, connected by mutual excitation. And the ones that are inhibitory are connected by mutual inhibition. And the ones that are mixed are connected with other weights. So there are uh, four kinds of weights because there are four kinds of pairs uh, being directed between the EI and the IE pairs. So they, they put some input and, and also each neuron is stochastic and a, a little bit, so it does the, but only a little bit, so it doesn't overwhelm the whole system. And what you see is part A of this figure is the raster plot of the output of their firing system. Um, now, the first thing that we notice is that there's stochasticity there. And the second thing we notice is that just by eye, we can see there are columns. And we can see that there is, in fact, something like a 40 hertz periodicity uh, not, uh, with, a, with noise. And if we add up the, uh, and compute the number of firings in each column, we get a picture, or they get a picture like B on the right, uh, where the red is corresponding to the excitatory process of firings, point, we could call it point process of firings, being probabilist. And, and the blue is the, is, uh, the uh, counting process of uh, firings of the inhibitory neurons. And then part C is the, I like to call it the power spectral density of uh, the uh, excitatory process. And it has, as you see, a, a large peak at around 40 hertz. Actually, it's about 37 hertz, but uh, we'll call it 40. And now I want to um, give you a little uh, forecast what is coming, an outline of the rest of the talk. So I've talked a bit already about point one, the consciousness and intention that we would really like to understand. And uh, we just looked at a firing model. so. You know what I mean when I say that. By rate model, I'm going to mean a, uh, a, a collection of stochastic differential equations, which are uh, obtained by which, where the process is the process, the stochastic process of weights that, uh, and uh, an obsession of mine currently is how is the firing model, such a firing model related to such a rate model? Do, uh, we don't yet have explicitly written out a, a, a proof that uh, links the firing model with the rate model. Uh, with, so in, in, in some way it amounts to um, Connecting the point process with the, which uh, which is uh, kind of Poisson based with the rate model, which is Gaussian based, but we we believe that we know base in some basic way how to uh, prove limit theorems that involve 
uh, Poisson processes, no matter how fancy, converging in some uh, some definite norms, but sense to uh, Ga uh, Gaussian based, uh, not Gaussian model, but Gaussian based model. Uh, and so, and so uh, a problem for probabilists is going to be to make that connection, but I'm getting away from my outline and into my talk too much. Uh, the next point is about how frequencies arise from it and in uh, in neuron models, and I'm going to have a particular point of view on that, namely one that has to do with quasi cycles, which is our name for uh, stochastic EI pairs producing frequencies. Um, and then have, having, uh, having established a viewpoint on how we get frequencies, it's uh, valuable to have some information about such processes. So there are a number of results I want to show you uh, where we get information uh, Compute uh, information how to do our uh, stochastic computations with such processes. And then finally, something about the particular problem about uh, the cortex and the pulvinar and, and the result that we have, which is related to, but a little different from the, uh, the one of uh, the one that I showed you on the first slide of uh, quarks at all. So suppose we have a stochastic firing model uh, with interactions written into the firing equations. Um, in nice cases, and the question is going to be, what are the nice cases? But in nice cases, which will no doubt include some uh, large families of where the interactions are homogeneous and, and then some separate families where in, in different families, the interactions are different. And in this case, uh, we believe there are approximate, approximating rate equations and the rates should be related to the point process of firing. So one of the problems is what are these nice cases? And another problem is, uh, and I like this one quite a bit, uh, how does the choice of model neuron influence the firing model? So, and how, and uh, so are there different, uh, different kinds of neuron models that we are going to lead to different answers? Or, uh, or is it that once we get this kind of a uh, firing model going, or same for the rate model, uh, do we get pretty much the, the same uh, model as an outcome from any firing model we might choose to use? We, I haven't seen any work on this, but it's a question that pops into my mind a lot. So this is, this is now, um, oh, someone wants to uh, yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, Priscilla. When you are saying homogeneous interaction, you mean uh, all uh, neurons interact in the same way? Yes, within the class. Within the class, okay. Yes. And uh, when you are considering two classes of neurons in the cortex, homogeneous in each class or homogeneous for, yes, in, for in, all? Yes, within each class. In each class. Yes, two, in, yes. Two, in two classes so that, of so that we, we have we have regions where so suppose we just we just look at at pairs which are ii with mm -hmm. and there all of those ii interactions should be the same but mm -hmm. then pairs which are ie they have a different interaction but all of those are the same okay Okay. Thank you. Idea. Thank you very and, much. And you can get the idea also by looking at at this picture. So uh, this is a picture of quarks et al. And and uh, they are also thinking of these classes when they program their computer model because they have all all the neurons 
So you see the arrows that, that goes from the E to the E, that would be the one, one type of interaction, just one within the class E to he. But, but when they go to E to I, then they have another interaction. So each one of those arrows corresponds to a fixed type of interaction, but between separate neurons. So they're falling into these classes. The, the big circles are indicating the classes and the arrows are indicating the a type. Each arrow indicates a different type of interaction. And then uh, they've put in, and this is an important part of their model, the pulvinar with uh, produ producing, and they, uh, and to get the alpha, uh, frequency they simply add into their um, integrated fire model, they add a sinusoid with a frequency of 10 hertz. And um, going into the, the, uh, the, it, the class on the right, uh, they add what we call a phase shift. And phase shift isn't really quite the right name for it, but you'll see how this phase shift delta uh, phi is defined uh, later on. And then their, uh, their results, which we pick up and, uh, and extend in a way, is their result is that you get the best interaction communication between area one and area two. Oh, you can't see my hand. I need to use my arrow. Between area one and area two, you get the best communication when this delta phi is minus pi over two. Now this really caught our attention because why should minus pi over two be special for this in this particular context? And actually, our result indicates that it's actually not special, that there's something else that's going on, which um, may turn out like, like this, like their result, but there are other possibilities too. So we uh, save that for later and go on. Thank you. Okay, so on the right is uh, the scheme, the... Uh, and, and it is also a stochastic um, circuit on the right. And on the left, you see our uh, generalization of it. Uh, what we're adding in is two things. The pulvinar is coming in two pieces so that we have a separate uh, input from uh, pulvinar one and pulvinar two into the inhibitory classes of our two regions. And something else that's added is that the link between the excitatory process in uh, region one and region two is, um, it's there. In, well, in their model, this is absent actually, but in our model, there is an additional phase shift that enters our model in between the classes. Uh, and so we now have two phase shifts. And uh, just for orientation, I'll tell you in advance that our result is that we get optimal communication between area one and area two when these two phase shifts are equal. It doesn't have to be minus pi over two. It can be any uh, any phase shift, but it but what is important is that two different kinds of phase shift, one in the fast frequency and one in the slow frequency, that both of these are equal. Uh, now I'm going to uh, focus more on uh, what I call EI pairs. So the quasi cycles and and uh, this is a building block, as you see. For us, it's a building block in the uh, in the circuit. And when we saw 
when we saw this motif appearing, it, appearing in the circuit of uh, quarks at all, we thought, ah, oh, what will, what can we get the result that they get uh, in, using instead of a fi their firing type of model if we use our uh, quasi cycle model uh, for uh, to substitute for those EI pairs. Now that model is just a nice linear stochastic model. As you see here, this is a bivariate model where the matrix A, as you see, is controlled by the, the interaction weights between the pieces of the EI pair. And, uh, and the, the matrix N is an identity matrix multiplied by a constant sigma. So it's just the uh, the standard deviation of the two the two components of the noise. Um, important thing about this matrix in our the important thing about this matrix is that in for the constants that are realistic and and the weights actually that are used by quarks at all and also us in this study. Those uh, with those weights, the matrix, um, the matrix minus A has eigenvalues minus lambda plus minus I omega, which are written out here. But the point about them is that those uh, that we have complex eigenvalues, and the complex eigenvalues give rise to the rotation. In other words, the frequency and the omega is the frequency. So it is by adjusting the the SIJs or the S E and I and so on that one can one sees that one has the creation of frequencies from the EI pairs. And so the same basic thing is going on in the firing model, but it's just that it's written different. Well, it's written differently. And so this, this is uh, what gives rise to this, the uh, hypothesis that these two models are uh, very much the same. And there is there's a very strong connection because uh, one can see how their frequencies are generated and they're generated in basically the same way as ours from the complex eigenvalues of this matrix. At least that's the way we think about it. And we think that's a very reasonable viewpoint on, on uh, this phenomenon. Now I want to uh, describe some mathematical facts about the quasi-cycle process of VT, the solution of the equation, equations that uh, we were looking at. What we proved a few years ago, uh, together with Baxendale, is that that process is very well approximated when lambda over omega is small, in other words, lambda is small relative to omega, we're close to the fixed point of the system. So in that case, our process is well approximated by a constant, that's the sigma over root lambda times Q, which you see there in terms of the weights and the eigenvalues, and, and the stochastic part that factors out is a standard two-dimensional ornstein uhlenbeck process with independent components. So if we, look, if we look at our process V in terms of the radial and phase processes, uh, uh, we can actually write, we write, uh, we can write explicitly uh, differential equations for the radial and phase processes in, in terms of the same const, uh, parameters. And um, 
Another and another thing we can we can compute then is that the ratio of the of the envelopes or amplitudes of the ENI processes, the ratio of the amplitudes is approximately constant, independent of time and independent of the stochasticity. And what goes along with that is the difference of the phases of the ENI processes also is approximately constant, independent of time and the stochasticity. And um, below are some references for that. And then on the next slide, uh, we see a sample path uh, where you can, where the, the red is the uh, path of the uh, excitatory process and the blue is com the, com the excitatory component of the V process and the blue is the inhibitory component. And at a glance, one can see that something very like what I just said is going on, the ratio of the amplitudes and the difference of the phases is a constant, uh, which is, which is uh, a very interesting thing to contemplate and also very useful when it comes to calculating, uh, answering questions about th this process. Okay, now let's go back and look at how far we've gotten through our outline. Actually, I think I, that we are about to launch into point five, which is about the two regions of the cortex together with a pulvinar forming a stochastic neuro, neural circuit. Now, I advertised in the title that uh, the uh, this this is going to be about building a neural circuit. Really, it's quarks at all that built this neural circuit, basically. And we uh, we started from their model. So this is again uh, just to remind us about um, the picture that uh, quarks at all started from, with two areas of the cortex which are connected through, you notice, through the excitatory uh, parts. And the inhibitory parts are connected in that there is an input of uh, 10 hertz frequency into both parts, uh, both inhibitory parts of our two, two areas, but with the with area two re receiving the input with a phase shift. And we'll see uh, exactly what that means a bit later on. When the, uh, now you remember the raster plot where we had just gamma frequency. Now we have alpha frequency coming in from the pulvinar and we see that just looking at the la raster plot, there is a combination. There is the alpha frequency, that's the big stripes, and then the smaller stripes that were associated with the alpha, the faster gamma frequency, we can also see those. So it's that the, uh, the alpha components have been grouped together by the the gamma components have been grouped together by the slower alpha components to make in the combination in the in the firing model. And we see that also when they sum up, they get uh, they get the groupings of the spikes of the uh, peak, the groupings of the peaks uh, associated with the gamma frequency, and the groups themselves form the Alpha, the slower alpha frequency. Uh, and down here is uh, the, in the red, the same, the same power spectral density curve that we saw before, but with the alpha, com alpha frequency coming in from the pulvinar, there is an additional alpha peak here. And we still have the gamma peak, but it's a lower intensity and broader. 
And here is a, a spectrogram of the same thing where you see that the higher frequency is coming in. Uh, it's coming in with a paced out by the uh, slower gamma. The slower, the gamma frequency is paced out by the slower alpha frequency in the rest in the uh, spectrogram. Okay, and and here is the slide that shows their result, uh, which is this little graph, this little blah plot here, which is showing the, uh, the what they call uh, gamma phase coherence. So it's coherence is a stand-in for the strength of the uh, communication from the first area to the second area. And it's, it's, um, it's an expression that I'll show you in a couple of minutes uh, mathematically, which, um, which is all, also a way of expressing how, how the uh, information is transferred, to what extent information is transferred between the two areas. So what does what do we see in the plot, which is a, uh, which is coherence is a function of alpha phase difference. So it's that delta phi that was coming, the delta phi, which separates the two outputs out of the pulvinar uh, that's on the horizontal axis. And there is a maximum, zeros here. And where is the maximum? And the maximum is at uh at minus pi over two and that is their result at least one of the, there's many results in this paper but this is the result that we're focusing on so what we do is to replace the neuron populations in their model with ei pairs so we have uh, we're now thinking of this as um uh, producing the v, RV process uh, and this one, another co independent copy to start out with, but then they're not independent because there is input from one to the other on the E level. And they're further not independent because there's input from the pulvinar on the I level, both cases. So, there, so the circuit is, uh, now, a big question mark. We know how we built it, but we don't know what it does as a connected circuit. Uh, and here is our, uh, here are our equations labeled from some, taken from some place else uh, with these numbers, but uh, 14 and 15 here are, uh, are the mathematical expressions for our model, actually. Uh, and you see that the, uh, the linear parts that were there are still there, but in addition, there is, in addition, there's a B1 going into the, C, the C1 process, and there's a B2 going into C2 process. Now, what are they? Well, they're what's coming in from the pulvinar. They are uh, sinusoids, at least in, in the first step of this replacement, we keep the, we keep the sinusoids rather than making those uh, also be quasi-cycles. And they're just sinusoids added in, as you see. And this C21 is uh, the, uh, it's, uh, a fraction of this process the going into there. Of which so process? Where? Uh, Eva, what's your question? Yeah, I, I didn't understand. The C21 is a fraction of which process because I don't see... Oh, it. yes. It's a fraction of the, the E component. So it's what we called VE on the previous slide. And a fraction of that is going in and being added into uh, into the second component of of uh, the 
it's in this in the second component in the second area it's being added in so so and the fraction is this c21 little c21 is uh that fraction um and i think we used one half okay so we we wanted to um we wanted to see what the coherence process will be between those two components but it's too complicated and we couldn't we knew we knew what kind of answer we, we thought we knew because of quarks we thought we'd get quarks result but um but we decided to simplify and just reduce those two equations to the bare bones of just uh, what would happen if we just add the two sinusoids and and uh, call that process G1, and then the two sinusoids, but with the phase shift. And you now see explicitly how that phase shift comes in. It's the sign of the frequency plus the shift delta phi uh, for the fast one, and and uh, the sign of the shift the frequency, uh, slow frequency plus delta psi. The other one is phi, and this one is psi. How, why did I do that to myself? <laughs> um, and uh, so we can compute the coherence between those two deterministic simple sums of sinusoids. So the, the formula for the coherence and, and I've written it as a, a function of those two shifts because that's what I'm interested in is how the coherence acts when everything is constant except those two shifts. Uh, and what it is, is is an average based on differences of instantaneous phase, that theta is instantaneous phase, which is computed from the analytic combined signal uh, using a Hilbert transform. So there's a formula for that, and I'm not going to go into the details of it, but please believe that it does make sense. It is defined mathematically. So um, we modestly call this a lemma, although it's our main result in some sense, because we cannot get the uh, version uh, in our real models, and but it's very suggestive what we get for this uh, deterministic simplification of the model, and what it, it the result is that that function rho the coherence is periodic, uh, with the with this period in this example it's the just the slow period the ten hertz. Uh, it's piecewise linear and it's maximal when the two shifts are the same. And this shows uh, what the theta is. On the bottom here, you can see what the theta is uh, in terms of the um, envelope function. So this is, this is the function starting on the left, A. If we put delta psi, equal to zero, then we get this piecewise linear function. This is the function rho of the two variables with a second one set equal to zero. We get a function with a maximum with delta phi equal to zero. And it's a periodic piecewise linear function. If we now um, move our delta psi to minus pi over two, course, which is natural corresponding to the result of quarks et al. Then we get, yes, that the function delta, the function rho of delta psi has a maximum at minus pi over two. So when we set, when we set the, uh, the shift, and remember now, it's the shift in the connection between the E components. 
up at the top of the diagram. We set that equal to minus pi over two. Then we get their result, the quark's result, which is that the maximum is at minus pi over two. But in addition, we get that the same thing is true no matter what delta psi is, as long as it's equal to delta phi. <laughs> okay, and then the part C of a diagram is the, uh, the smoothed version when we put the noise back in. If we put the noise back in, then we can, uh, then we can compute or even do the mathematics, although I haven't written it out, that we get this smooth function for the, uh, the function of rho of those two variables, those two shift variables. It, it's, and, it, and if you look at the, the uh, part, if you look at the first half of this function uh, between uh, the left half, going down from zero, you see that it's very much like the function that uh, quarks got from their firing model. So we feel that this is strong evidence that uh, these two models are giving us the same answer, but not quite the same answer, <laughs> a version of the same answer. Next, this is, uh, uh, again, I think I put this slide in twice. This is the um, the gamma uh, the fun the function of gamma coherence, which would be the rho as a function of the alpha phase difference delta by. Oh, this this is just to to show that indeed this function looks very much the same. There, the quarks function looks very much the same as our computed one on that slide. Yeah, I wanted to show what this looks, what these functions look like written out more explicitly. So what the B is, it's a, a vector uh, functions with zero in the first component and the sign is going in the second component. And it's similarly the B tube, except this is, there's a typo right here, it should be 10. And uh, and what the C is, it's what Eva was talking about earlier. Okay, so this is our uh, simulation data and I'll just, um, I'll just focus on the fact that this is uh, this is looking at the power spectral density that's uh, in the second component of the second region, and you see that there is actually two two uh, peaks in the power spectral density. One, at, are you here on the B picture? Yeah, that one, B picture. Yeah, so there's there's a strong peak at the 40 hertz again, and there's uh, and and broadened, and there's also a peak at the uh, 10 hertz. And it's not surprising in view of what we know about these uh, the communication be, uh, between. We know about. Uh, Remember the result that I showed you that the uh, that the rate the the there is communication between these E and I processes that is very strong. So when you put input into the I processes, it's transferred to the E processes uh, as a result of this uh, property of quasi cycles that the two comp the two components have phases and amplitudes that are locked to each other in this way that I pointed out. So it's showing that in our circuit model, that behavior is holding up. And of course, it's C that is showing the um, uh, 
result that we get from our model with simulation uh, showing that if we set delta psi equal to minus pi over two, we get the maximum of the coherence function rho at also minus pi over two. So this, this is this is the uh, simulation. And the reason it's rough, it's not that it's really rough, it's that uh, Lawrence did the simulations. They had to be separate simulations for for different values of delta phi. And he didn't want to do enough of them to make a smooth curve out of it. So he just did a few. And so they're bumpy. Yeah. And this uh, and the other two are about the uh, the communication. In fact, uh, interactions between the cortex and the pulvinar are central to attention and consciousness, and they form a neural circuit, arguably, at least we can model like that. Uh, also, firing and rate models may, and in this example, do express the same stochastic dynamics. Uh, there were two problems for probabilists. One is the influence on the circuit of the neuron model choice. And the other one is when is it that firing rate models and rate mo firing models and, uh, and uh, uh, SDE models based on rates are equivalent. Uh, and there's a couple of people are interested in that question that I've talked to about it. And so I'm hoping that that there's going to appear uh, in not too distant future some answers to that. Uh, and then uh, there are results that I showed you about the EI stochastic rate processes. The quasi cycles have some uh, useful properties in terms of analysis of neural circuits, maybe in useful for other neural circuits besides this particular one. And, uh, and then our uh, point that communication in the cortex as controlled via the pulvinar may involve phase differences in these two frequencies, the alpha slow and the gamma fast frequencies. So now, thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question. The width of the peaks, I'm sorry for my English, in the power spectrum correspond to inverse characteristic times. These characteristic times correspond to exponential decay rates. So the thinnest peak corresponds to the longest relaxation time. Do you have an interpretation for these times in this context? Short answer is is no but please please send me an email with this question and i will think about it i have trouble with the first uh the first statement that the width of the peaks in the power spectrum i'm not getting the context of the power spectrum of what um and it is this question completely it can't be independent of context because you were asking me in this context i think so he's been, it, we were speaking about this uh, oh this oh there um yes okay so you're into you're asking about the widths of the peaks and there is definitely a meaning to the width of the peaks the the peak the very narrow mm -hmm. peak at of the uh slow frequency, it's because that frequency is being inserted <coughs> raw into the system. It's just the sinusoid is being inserted into the system with a little bit of noise. But the, the, the broader peak, the 40 hertz peak, that's coming from quasi-cycles. So there's a lot of noise in that peak, you see. So it's broader because it's it's uh, its birth is from uh, noise uh, 
causing a damped oscillation to become a sustained oscillation. And then the sustained oscillation is centered at that frequency. So it's almost, you're seeing the noise with the, um, with the frequency of what would be a damped oscillation without the noise uh, is picked up out of the noise. So what you're seeing is actually a profile of the noise and how much that frequency is, is picked up together. So it, it, it should be thought of as, uh, as a, you're, you're, looking at, you're looking at the Gaussian noise but perturbed by the fat, uh, filtered in a way by the deterministic aspect of the model, which is telling us that there's a damped oscillation of a certain frequency there. I just uh, would ask uh, uh, what means the equivalence between two model, Farron and rate, in which sense there should be equivalent? Okay, so, uh, so there, there is the theorem that that a Poisson point process, uh, out of a Poisson point process, you can take a limit and get a, and get a, uh, a normal a Gaussian mm -hmm. object. Okay. And, and this is true, uh, this is true <clears throat> on many, many different levels in many, many different contexts, actually. And, uh, in fact, I have spent, I, at some point in, in my life, I said to myself, I have spent too much of my life proving this same, basically the same theorem over and over and over in slightly different contexts. Uh, uh, and, uh, and so, uh, and so one feels when one has a point pros, what, point process. So there's one there's <coughs> one question about it. Is it is this point process really coming from something which is Poisson like enough in some limit that it is going to converge to a Gaussian when normalized and not something else. Mm -hmm. So but, so that's one aspect. But in, in this kind of model we see that yes, um, the raw pieces are not quite Poisson, but we can look at, if we, if we look at the pieces of the model one by one locally, we can see that mm -hmm. it's a kind of sum of many Poisson-like processes. And so this part of it is going to be okay. And, and you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind, kind of limit uh, is uh, uh, locally, or uh, either spatially or temporally? Uh huh. So, so I answered only part of your question. I understand. Um, so it's um, it's that yes, it's it's, it's space time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Answer is it's space time, but in the space, it's it's finite. There's only finite number. Namely, there's two components in the in the firing process there's two components there's the firing of the excitatory and the firing of the inhibitory and then mm -hmm. in the in the uh, in the Wait. yeah in the gaussian version that uh, that i want to see is a limit in some sense of the other one uh, there is also the equation for the process attached to to the uh, well, there's two components because in our model we have two regions, but there's uh, another two components because there's the excitatory part and the inhibitory part in each region. So, th so, so those two uh, those two parts are a kind of of uh, simplification of a spatial aspect, and there might be many. So. So people make models where there's a, a whole, um, there's a, a finite collection of spatial points, and then, uh, and then people make models also where that becomes a continuous variable. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of, there's a lot of 
Uh, there's a lot of serums, actually. There's a lot of serums sitting there waiting to be used in this context. And so you might say, well, we've already proved that serum, but there's still some work to be done to identify how to use this serum specifically in this context. And that can be a lot of work too, actually. So that's, <laughs> that's why we don't say, well, it's just already done. The equations are uh, very similar to um, um, uh, visual cortex, uh, to the one of, uh, used for, to model visual cortex in a, in a regime that is called inhibition stabilized network. So, um, you have um, whatever, it's exactly the same equation. Uh, so it's, uh, there are with certain Cohen equations, two populations, et cetera, inhibitory. And the inhibition, so if you remove the, the, uh, the, the inhibition, the, the, the excitatory population activity just grows without bond, let's say, and then you have very strong inhibition. <coughs> when you couple those two, um, then you have a, a network that is stable. So why is it interesting? It's because that's a basic mechanism to generate uh, gamma oscillation uh, in the cortex. And there's a very nice uh, paper by uh, Ozeki, an experimental paper, where they argue that ISN, so inhibition stabilized network, are very nice uh, a model to support uh, many kinds of evidence uh, related to basically, uh, or, or related to visual cortex. And so, I mean, a lot of work has been devoted to, if you look at ISN, to periodic forcing of ISN, to uh, if you look at different modules, um, hypercolon in the visual cortex, they basically are um, connected through EE connections. And so I think it's a very nice, um, I mean, I didn't make the, uh, I didn't realize during the talk that there are the, the questions and uh, basically the equations there, they were so, so similar. So maybe you... You want me to show the, the equation once more? No, it's fine or...? To me, it's fine. But I mean, the paradigm is very similar. It's not pulvinar and cortex. It's just visual cortex and Hermann Schwartz, for example. Uh, oh. uh, I studied this a lot. Um, so, Romain, could you send me some references, please? Sure. Uh, you can get my email address very easily, I think, from your colleagues. But it is in the... It's, oh, yes, I will. It's in the list. Yeah, yeah, oh, will. yeah, that's right. It's in the list. Yes, yes. I'd like to look. Um, and I'd like my colleague also to look. He's, yeah, who, who his, um, yeah, he's, he's the... Um, psychotherapist among us and he knows particular a lot more a lot more about the specific uh, applications than I do I'm very um, handicapped in that way but but I'd like to look at your equations and see like you did what how they are similar oh I have it if I have the mic for one more sec yes <laughs> um, um... Did you try to do the same kind of experiments or numerical simulations with the nonlinear equations, or did it yield the same result? Or? Oh, oh, the 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 thing is the thing about the nonlinear equations is that in these contexts, and this is another problem for probabilists, but maybe maybe not probabilists, but maybe just dynamical system theorists in general. In this type of model, it seems that there is always a fixed point, an important fixed point, no matter how nonlinear. <coughs> and, and once yes. one gets this fixed point, one can linearize at the fixed point, of course. And the question is, is the oscillation in which we are interested, is that generated by uh, complex eigenvalues appearing out of a matrix at that fixed point. And it can be multidimensional. Um, and when there, are, when there are complex eigenvalues for some region and there's something in nature that, that the complex, the real part of the complex eigenvalue pair <laughs> is closer to the fixed point than the others. So that actually the, uh, 
So it means the rotation is dominant over the rest of the dynamics. You see what I mean? Yes. And it means that if you if you just look at the neighborhood of this fixed point, you will get uh, not the whole picture, of course, but you will get the important first term of the dynamics. Even when even if you have a limit cycle, you the limit cycle, and I've seen a number of examples like this, the, the limit cycle will be in a way controlled from the fixed point. You get the limit cycle because the whole thing is bounded. And so actually you're on the other side, you're on the positive side of the fixed point. So the lambda is positive you, and the thing is expanding, because, but because it's bounded, it cannot go to infinity because of the positive eigen, real part of the eigenvalue. It's bounded, and so it has to stop. It has, it has to stop, and it has to have a limit cycle. So the limit cycle can actually be created in the in the beginning, as it were, from from the unstable fixed point. And so I'm I'm yeah. thinking that in in neuroscience, it there might be some kind of result that that fixed points are doing a large part of the job uh, the, if we look at both contractions and the expansions at fixed points that we get uh, we get all these cycles that we see in the data in the in the psychophysical data uh, we get them all from uh, complex eigenvalues at fixed points. In general, it's a good question for probabilists how to derive, how to study the equivalence between point loss models and rate models. So uh, Pablo has been doing it for, for interacting Markov systems. Uh, probably neuronal systems are not Markov, so at least we believe they are not Markov. So it's an interesting question. Yeah, you know, I have a comment about that. And it is uh, when you're brought up as a probabilist, which, you know, I have a long history of that <laughs> before this current era. <laughs> um, when you're brought up as a probabilist, you are told if it's not Markov, you make it Markov by uh, throwing in what you need from the sigma field as part of the past, as part of the present process and well, and Pablo, then you is that yeah. is that your approach or it's you do something quite different perhaps well if if you ever give me the microphone a little bit more so it, it turns out <laughs> that we have been working on this evan myself and pablo uh we are working with uh, uh, systems of point process with the memory of variable lens ah uh. And uh, so these are not Markovian. So we, of course you can well, put the entire past history in the game. So if you do this, it, everything is Markovian. All all infinite order processes are Markovian. Mm -hmm. But this is what we do. So we, in order to describe the time evolution, it's not uh, sufficient to to know situation at a given uh, at a given time. You need to to know part of the history. So it, it, it's interesting. So it, it's a mixture. So you know, there are two things. In the in the seventies, uh, Frank Spitzer introduced the class of interacting Markov process, and that's how we, Pablo and I, meet. We started working on this a long time ago, and more recently, well, ten years later, uh, Jean Marissonnet observed that if you want to model the work, most of the process are not markovian but uh, you can uh, you can you can predict the next step just by looking a suffix of the past not always the same it could be very long or very short and if you call it a uh, uh, stochastic process with mm -hmm. memory variable length mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. it turns out that this seems to be a wonderful model for for neuronal activity and mm -hmm. so, so, so it. Um, do you agree, Pablo? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 It's it's an it's an interesting interesting thing 
to face up to this as I have not done in the past. So I look forward to, uh, to our interaction about this.